I think this is uh, where we left off last time. I think we uh, got partially through the heating and humidification topic, but I think it's probably good that we just uh, kind of hit it from the start quickly again. So this is a typical device that we would use for this little derivation. Uh, let's see, so we just have a single uh, mass flow rate of mass air of moist air rather coming through, uh, probably given to us as a volume flow rate and we would have to convert to the mass flow rate in the problem solution. But at any rate, so we have a mass flow rate of dry air, has moisture in it. It has a total enthalpy of I1, uh, moisture level, uh, humidity ratio uh, W1 comes in, uh, goes across a heating coil transfer some heat into it, so sensible heating. And then we hit a point we're gonna call A, and then uh, beyond A, we go across a humidifier section where we're gonna spray some condition of moisture, water, uh, could be vapor, or it could be atomized uh, droplets that have to evaporate. And then everything leaves, uh, kind of comes to equilibrium uh, and leaves at what, point two. So we have the same mass flow rate of dry air, but we have more enthalpy because we have more sensible and moisture, uh, uh, sensible energy and latent energy in terms of the moisture in the airstream, and we have a, a higher humidity ratio. So I think we talked through all the equations before, so I think I'll skip over that. Uh, you know, from the well, from the energy balance and from the uh, water balance. Uh, this is the water in, water added, and water out. And so this is energy in equals energy out. So just uh, the, the mass balance on water and the energy balance, we combine those equations, do a little math, and we can get it uh, into uh, either 338 or 338A. Um, the only difference being that the mass flow rate of the dry air times the increase in humidity ratio is the mass flow rate of water added. So these two terms are the same thing. So just writing it in two different forms. Okay, so this is the total process from one to two. And let's see, I guess we need to look on the site chart. Okay, so from one to two, that's the total process. But, you know, the way we drew the diagram, we did sensible heating from one to A, and then from A to two is the effect of the humidification process. Okay. So, um, if I look at these two equations, this is the entire process from one to two. Okay, if we want to write equations um, for the two processes separately, well, we know this is sensible heating from one to A. So Q dot would be the enthalpy at A minus the enthalpy at one times the mass flow rate. And that would say how much sensible energy we had to put in, okay? And the latent is um, the enthalpy at two minus the enthalpy at A times the mass flow rate, that's the energy. Or for the amount of water, we can do W2 minus W1 times the mass flow rate of the dry air. And that'll tell us how much uh, water that we had to add. Um, I can also use this equation for the process from A to two, and I can simplify it because if you look from A to two, that's just across the humidifier there is no Q dot term from A to two, because if you look at your device, the Q has already happened. We've already added the heat. So if I wanna use those equations, I certainly can, and uh, I, I need to simplify them by setting the Q dot term equal to zero. Okay, so it's gonna give the same result. So then the uh, delta enthalpy over delta uh, humidity ratio is just equal to the enthalpy of the water that's injected by the humidifier. 
So this could be steam or this could be liquid uh, water that, like I said, that was atomized, okay? And so we can come up here to this uh, protractor, which the outer scale is delta I over delta W. Uh, if we know the enthalpy of the condition of the water that's put in, whether it's steam or you know, uh, water that's at liquid water droplets or whatever, then we can draw this process line. And the way this is drawn, it would be steam, fairly high temperature steam when it slopes. And you know that because the dry bulb temperature is increasing across the humidifier from whatever this low, whatever this temperature is up to this temperature at two, it's an increase. And so that steam is gonna to have to be fairly warm in order to accomplish that. So that process line would be down here someplace. And so you could do that just from the enthalpy. You can bring that slope over and draw a line with that slope starting at two down and cross the sensible heating line. And that would define this point A for you. So that's kind of what we'll see when we uh, look at the uh, problem solution techniques for this. Okay, and that's what this is talking about. We can break uh, the process down into one to A, sensible heating and A to two humidification. Uh, and that's the way it would really be accomplished, first heating, then humidification. So when we do just that humidifier and use the equation, we call that adiabatic humidification of moist air. And so this is our general equation. Again, we set the Q dot equal to zero and we get that delta I over delta W is just the enthalpy of the water that's injected. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and it really simplifies when we, we work these problems on a psych chart, they're really uh, pretty easy. Uh, unless you, the enthalpy runs you off of the psych chart, which is, can be a little bit of a complication, but we'll have some equations to deal with that case. Okay, so here, let's go down and look at this figure. So this figure kind of summarizes um, different possible humidification process lines. And this is based on different enthalpies of moisture that are injected. So we've got kind of four cases that we'll talk through here to just kind of get a better feel for this. Okay. So one is if the moisture that the humidifier puts into the airstream is injected as uh, saturated vapor at the dry bulb temperature. So at whatever temperature that air comes into the humidifier, if we inject saturated steam at that same temperature, then the process line is constant dry bulb temperature. Well, that kind of makes sense because the steam's at the same temperature as the air molecules. When you inject them together, you're just adding the steam molecules to the flow. They're not hotter, they're not colder, so it doesn't change the temperature of the process line. So you just go straight up on the side chart indicating that you're adding moisture, but you're not heating or cooling the airstream that it's going into. So that's this special case, one to two, the vertical line is this number one, okay? Uh, number two, we could inject uh, moisture uh, that the enthalpy is greater than the enthalpy of saturated vapor at the dry bulb temperature. So if the enthalpy injected under uh, condition two is greater than the uh, moisture, the enthalpy of the moisture that we were talking about on case one, when it's at the dry bulb temperature of the dry air stream, then we're gonna have air will be heated and humidified. So that's this case where, you know, this could be, this could be 212 degree saturated steam, and if I put it into a 100 degree uh, dry uh, airflow, it's gonna heat it up some, right? Depending on how much moisture I put it in. So then this would be the, in, the higher enthalpy, which means when I come over here to the protractor, I get a greater slope and I come over here and I draw a line with that slope upward. And wherever I stop injecting moisture is where, uh, the exit condition on the humidifier would be, okay? 
So there's these two cases. And then we have a case three. Uh, if the enthalpy of the added moisture is less than the enthalpy of saturated vapor at the dry bulb temperature. So that's kind of our guidepost there, uh, the enthalpy of saturated vapor at the dry bulb temperature. Well, so uh, if the enthalpy is less, then it's gonna be cooler. And so then we're gonna get, we're gonna uh, add moisture, which means we're going up on the psych chart, but we're gonna cool the dry air down a little bit. So we'll see a cooling as well as uh, an increase in moisture or an increase in relative humidity for that flow. And then this last kind of limiting case down here, which you can tell I added later in my notes. Um, if, liquid if liquid water at the wet bulb temperature is injected, then that will produce a process line at constant wet bulb temperature, okay? And that's what this would be. So this would be a line of constant wet bulb. So whatever the wet bulb is at one, it, you just slide along that line of constant wet bulb up into the point that you quit adding moisture. And then that would be your exit condition <coughs> uh, from the humidifier. Okay. So um, think about that. It's, uh, you know, once you kind of understand what they're trying to convey to you, it's not terribly difficult. But when you first look at this thing, it's kind of crazy looking. Okay, so example three, six, let's pop over to the other uh, set of notes here real quick. Uh, I had scrolled ahead here, where's there's three, five. I think we did that one, three, six. Okay, so let's go over this a little bit. Okay, so this is gonna be heating and humidification. So, so we start out, we have moist air at 60 degrees, fairly cool for you know being in a space, 60, you get a little chilly. Uh, so we got moist air at 60 degrees uh, dry bulb and 20% relative humidity. Uh, enters the uh, uh, a heater and humidifier at a rate of 1600 cubic feet per minute. So immediately you noticed two things. One, you have a volume flow rate, CFM. And notice that CFM is at this condition at 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit dry bulb and 20% relative humidity. So when you go to convert this to a mass flow, you want the specific volume off of the site chart, or you can calculate it um, at this condition. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's necessary to heat the air followed by adiabatic humidification. So it leaves at a temperature of 115 and a relative humidity of 30%. Okay, saturated water vapor at 212 is injected. So see, that's where we'll go look up saturated water vapor at 212, and that's the enthalpy that we'll use for the moisture and so, you know, 212 is way hotter than this air. So it's going to heat it as well as humidify it. I mean, from common sense, you can tell that. Uh, we want to calculate the required heat transfer rate and mass flow rate of the steam that's uh, fed to the humidifier that goes into the airstream. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let me open, uh, let me open my side chart. I hadn't really done that today, uh, let's see, put that back here. Psych charts, these are, these are the good ones. And we can do that. And maybe a little bit better. Ah, this thing jumps. Uh, okay, so here's 60 and here's 20. So that's where we're starting. And we're going to what, 115 and 30. Okay, so if this was a paper, I was doing this with a with pen and paper on a side chart, I'd put a dot right here for 60 and 20. There's 20% 20 relative humidity, there's 60 dry bulb. And I would come over here at 115 
And see, you think at 30, that's not much of a moisture increase, but what you have to realize is as that air gets warmer, it can hold so much more moisture. And remember relative humidity is the amount of moisture that's in the air divided by the amount of moisture it can hold. And when that stuff gets at 115, it can hold a boatload compared to what it can hold at 60. So it may be, uh, you know, just seeing that 10% increase in relative humidity might make you think that you haven't added all that much moisture. But when you see it on the site chart, you go, oh, holy moly, <laughs> I've added quite a bit. So 60 and 20, you know, you're down here at a little bit above 0 0.002 pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. And we're going up 115, 10, 20, 30. We're going up to right here, which is, uh, what's that? 0 0.019 four or five, however you, looks like about five, We're reading right over there between, well, see there's point, there's point zero zero one nine and we're above that. So this is two, four, six, eight, up to point zero two. So anyway, you get, if you had a piece of paper and pencil, you draw, draw your little line across and, and you know, get, do a pretty good job of estimating it. So we're adding quite a bit of moisture to this. Okay. And so if I was doing this on a site chart, basically, I'll just talk through it here, then we can go look at it. So let's see. So there's my starting point. I would draw a horizontal line all the way across off the chart. And that's my sensible heating line. Okay. Then I'll go... Uh, let's see, I need to go to, yeah, let's go up here and I would go to my steam tables, which are up here at the top and I would go to 12. To 12 and I would look at the enthalpy of the vapor and you see it's 1150. So that's the enthalpy of that moisture that I'm adding. So you note that uh, someplace down here in our little solutions, uh, six. Okay, well, your author calls it, um, he rounded it to 1151. That's fine <laughs> within our ability to lay this out on a side chart, that's not gonna make any difference. So then we come up to the protractor here on the side chart and so here's, here's my delta H over delta W, which is uh, numerically equal to that enthalpy. And so there's 1,000, there's 1,100, there's 1,200. So what was I? 11, it was 1,150, wasn't it? So 1,150 is about right in here. And so then I would draw a line. I put a little tick mark on 1,150. I draw a line, and then I would have to take that slope of that line and bring it down to the uh, psych chart and I would go to my exit condition, which is 115 and 30 up here. And I would draw a line with that slope all the way down off the paper. And where my two lines cross, that identifies point A, which is the end of the heating coil and the beginning of the humidifier. So that's really the trick. The other thing I can do and probably should is draw a line between just states one and two, just to show the overall process line. Okay, so if we, we can go back up and then he's got charts up here. This thing's a little convoluted. We're getting close. Okay, so there's the uh, side chart drawn out. It's not really to scale like the one we were looking at, but it, you know, it basically it shows the same thing. So here's my horizontal line for sensible heating. I just draw it all the way off the page. I come up to the protractor. I get my slope of 1150. I bring that slope carefully down to this point and draw a line with that slope and wherever they cross is point A. And really once you've done that, 
you've basically solved the problem. You just have to go ahead and pull the numbers and it's the calculations are pretty simple. And again, that's a picture of the device. Just so everybody has that clear in your mind. Okay. So there's my 1151. Uh, so for the heat transfer rate, uh, and that's a, he uses a small Q, but this is a total Q. This is total BTUs per hour uh, that the coil has to put into the airstream. Oh, I'm unstable on the internet. Uh, well, that's the mass flow rate of the dry air times the enthalpy at A minus the enthalpy at one. And of course, then what I usually do first is I go ahead and get that mass flow rate from my volume flow rate. Okay. And so my cap, oh, this is why he uses the little Q for heat transfer because he uses the big Q dot for volume flow rate. And he doesn't want to conf confuse the two. Say we got too few symbols and too many, too many quantities to indicate. Um, so at any rate, so this is 1600 cubic feet uh, per minute. And so he wants this an hour. So he's going to multiply by 60. And then uh, that specific volume he's reading at 3.15. And so let's go back to the site chart. And so 60, so he's right over here. And so there's, there's 13, there's 13.1, there's 13.2. And so 13.15, this one looks like it might be 13.14 or something, but you know, it's right there. So I'd say he read it pretty well, okay. And so you divide, and that's uh, what feet cube per pound mass. And so when you divide by it, the feet cube cancel, and we get pound mass per hour. So our mass flow rate is uh, 7,300 pound mass per hour of dry air. And so that's what LB LBM is pound mass, and A is there to remind you it's a, the dry air flow that we're calculating here. Okay, then he goes to the psych chart. And he reads uh, his enthalpies at one and A. Uh, we can do one. We don't really, we haven't drawn it out, but one. So it would be right here. And so you'd have to read back over here. So it's over here in this range. You know, you'd have to take a straight edge and lay it down to get a good, a really good value. But what's he read it? He reads it at 16.8, which is in that area. Looks pretty good. And then at A, uh, when he laid this out on his real psych chart, he got 28.6, just reading enthalpies. And so the math is simple. 7,300 times that enthalpy difference gives uh, 86,140 BTUs an hour. So for this condition, that's the capacity that you would need. And you know, if you're specking a coral, you'd probably put 100,000 in there just to make sure that, you know, on a colder day, you could do it, uh, whatever, typically round up a little bit. And then the mass flow rate of steam uh, is the mass flow rate of dry air times the humidity ratio difference. Um, and so we go back up here real quick. There we go. So this, this W1 is the same humidity ratio at one and A because that's just sensible heating. So we read that. And then this is our ending point, point two. And so we read that and that difference is the moisture that the humidifier has to add. So then we just multiply that difference by the, uh, mass flow rate of the dry air right here. And so here's what, how he read those humidity ratios. You should check the psych chart, just make sure you, you know, are competent to read these things. And so we get about uh, 77 pounds mass of water vapor or steam per hour is needed by the humidifier in order to do this, okay? So, okay, so 
I'll leave this one on our next example, but we got to go look at the discussion. Okay. So our next topic is mixing, adiabatic mixing of two streams of moist air. And so we do this all of the time in HVAC systems. Uh, you know, location one could be outside ventilation air and location two would often be return air. And so, you know, we put in just as much ventilation air as ASHRAE 62, the code requires. We mix it with return air. And so this state would be called mixed air. Uh, and then uh, it goes on, let's say three would be the mixed air condition that would go on probably across a coil for either heating or cooling, depending on what season that we're in. Okay, so for each one of these, now I've got a mass flow rate at one, mass flow rate of dry air at one, it has a particular enthalpy and humidity ratio. I've got a mass flow rate of air at two, probably different. Uh, it has a different enthalpy and a different humidity ratio. And then these guys mix together and I have a mass flow rate at three, which is just the sum of the mass flow rates at one and two, as you would assume. Uh, and it has an enthalpy and a humidity ratio that results from this mixing process. So uh, straightforward on the energy balance and the uh, mass balance on dry air. So energy balance, the mass flow rate, the dry air at one times the enthalpy at one, that's coming in. The mass flow rate of dry air at two times the enthalpy at two, that's coming in, they mix and we've got the mass flow rate at three times the enthalpy at three leaving. So coming in, coming in and leaving. And then like we said, mass flow rate at one plus mass flow rate at two equals mass flow rate at three. Very simple. Um, and then, oh, we can do the water balance. Let's see if I can get all that on the screen at once. Uh, not, pretty close, not quite. I guess I could make it one smaller. By golly, then I can get it all on screen at once. Okay, so uh, the water in is the mass flow rate of dry air times the humidity ratio at one. So that math is pounds of water vapor uh, per minute or hour, whatever your uh, time base is on your mass flow. And then we do the same thing at uh, two, mass flow rate of dry air at two times W2 is the amount of moisture that's coming in here in the dry air flow. And then what goes out, <clears throat> uh, M dot A3 um, times W3. And so this plus this has to equal this because moisture in, moisture in, moisture out. We got steady state, steady flow conditions. So then, so you got three equations to play around with and I didn't go through all the math. I mean, it's substitution and uh, rearrangement. But so you can uh, come up with an equation like this. This is uh, one way <laughs> that this gets written. And so this says that I2 minus I3. Okay, so this is the one that comes in the bottom minus I3 divided by uh, I3 minus I1 is equal to <clears throat> the humidity ratios. Uh, W2 minus W3 over W3 minus W1. And that's <clears throat> those ratios are equal to the ratio of the mass flow rate at one to the mass flow rate at two. Okay. Um, so conclusions, and I don't know if this would be immediately obvious to you or not, but they are true. <clears throat> the state of the mixed air streams must lie on a straight line on a psych chart between states one and two. Ah, so if you know one, know two, put them on a psych chart, draw a straight line, <clears throat> and three must lie someplace in between one and two. And then the other thing is the length of the line segments are proportional to the masses of dry air mixed. Ah. Well, that's kind of interesting too. So this is kind of like the inverse lever rule that we do in some course, <laughs> some mechanics course, I can't remember. It's been too long for me on mechanics. But so it, here's the deal. So 
you read all this stuff, but if you listen to me, I can, I can uh, make this really simple for you uh, and easy to apply. But it's simple, but it's easy to get this screwed up when you're working a problem. Okay, so state one, whatever it is, temperature, relative humidity, moisture, you gotta have uh, you know, two independent variables to define a state on the site chart. <clears throat> Uh, other than pressure, because the whole thing is at constant pressure. And then here's state two. So you just put those two dots and you draw a line. Okay. And then three has to lie on that line. So that's helpful information. Now let's think about it from the common sense. <clears throat> what if the mass flow rates were equal at one and two? Let's say this is 500 pounds mass an hour, and this is 500 pounds mass an hour. Where you add them together, you get 1,000 pounds mass per hour. And so where would the point be if the two mass flows are equal? Well, they'd be right in the middle, wouldn't they? You just add, and you just average everything. You just add everything together and divide by two. Okay, so that's pretty simple. So look at these last two, uh, these last two equations down here. <clears throat> are the two that I would recommend that you use when you work a mixing problem and then do it on the psych chart if you can. Uh, if you can't do it on the psych chart, then you can refer back to these equations and you could calculate enthalpies and all this stuff. And you can work from there. But if you're doing it on a psych chart, <clears throat> so the ratio of M dot A1, so that's the mass flow right here, to the total, because M dot A3 is the total, is equal to the inverse line length, 3, 2, divided by the total line length, 1 to 2. Well, so when you're doing this on a side chart, you put these dots on here, draw this line, and get your ruler out, and you measure the length of line segment 1 to 2. Okay, let's say it's 4 inches just to have some easy numbers. So you measure four inches. Well, if these were each the same mass flow, then that would say, okay, I measured two inches. In this case, it's gonna be the same from either direction, but the official thing would be that, <clears throat> so uh, if, if, if these are, uh, <clears throat> if they're the same, then this ratio is gonna be 0.5 and when I, when I take the length of line segment one, two times 0.5, if that's four inches, half of it's two inches. And that tells me that line segment three, two going this way is two inches. So now if it's 50, 50, it doesn't matter. But if it's anything other than 50, 50, it does matter. So let's say that we have 750 pounds mass an hour from one, and 250 from two. Well, 750 and 250 is a thousand. And so M dot one divided by the total is 0.75. And so I would take 0.75 times my four inches. And what is that? That's, uh, that's three inches. <laughs> good, I picked the numbers good. So I would measure three inches from two down this line segment and I put a dot and that on, on the line at that point and that's state three. And then I read all of the properties off of state three. So this is the kind of the practical ramification of it. You just remember you have to measure from the opposite end that you put up here in the numerator. So say if I, if I put M dot two up here in that example, then uh, M dot two would be 250 divided by a thousand. That would be 0.25. And so that would say line segment one three is 0.25 of my four inches or one inch up here. Okay. So you need to practice this a little bit, but it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Um, and of course you can use the equations if you want to. Okay. But these are the two that I typically will refer to. 
Okay, uh, three, seven. Let's go back and look at, I think we have a little example problem for this. Um, okay, and they're going to go back and uh, use equations. Uh, well, I, I think, let's see. Well, they do it both ways, actually, which is, which is good. Okay, so we're gonna say we have 2000 cubic feet per minute of air at 100 degrees Fahrenheit and 75 wet bulb are mixed uh, with 1,000 cubic feet per minute of air at 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 wet bulb. Process is adiabatic, so it's just adiabatic mixing uh, at, steady, at a steady flow rate at a standard sea level, so that means the psych chart applies. Find the uh, condition of the mixed air streams. Okay. So th this is um, using some of the equations and I don't, I don't think I actually uh, had this equation in my notes, but uh, so you can see if you reconstitute this, we're gonna see that W3 minus W1 uh, times M dot A3 is equal to M dot A2 times W, two minus W1. So there's, there's lots of different ways you can juggle those equations. So this is, this is uh, one way. Um, so what we have to do then is we have to calculate the mass flow rates uh, from the volume flow rates. So we know how to do that. So 1000 CFM times 60 divided by specific volume, 4542 pounds mass per hour. And uh, the, M dot A2 is 2000 times the 60 divided by 14.4. So it's 8332 pounds mass dryer per hour. And then plugging in these equations uh, where we can calculate and also uh, looking up the humidity ratios at one and two, then we can calculate the humidity ratio at three at point zero one zero three and then you can go into the psych chart and um, you you draw a line between those two points and you come across and we say do we have a we don't have a psych chart on this one um, let's see i guess we can go back to this yeah so basically what you've done is you just done a ratio and proportion between this point and this point based on the mass flow rates, okay? Uh, and you calculate W3 and then you take at that level you come across and when you hit the line be between the two points that defines uh, state three. Uh, let's see, so, <clears throat> or this is, this is the graphical procedure so he says he's using M dot A2. So that's 8332 divided by the total. So that's 0. 0.65. And so it says then line 31 is 65% of the line length of one, two. So then um, I don't have this thing drawn to scale for this, but in that case then you would measure this line length and you would take 65% of it and you would start at one and whatever distance that was, you would measure up there and then you would put your tick mark for uh, state three. So either way, I mean, if you're programming a computer, you're gonna have to do the equations. If you're doing it by hand on a side chart, uh, I would probably do the graphical. It's pretty quick once you get used to it. Okay. Work again. I'm not sure what that note refers to at this point. Okay. So now we do. We got plenty of time. So let's go back to the lecture notes. So we've done the adiabatic mixing. So let's talk about um, uh, space air conditioning design conditions. So we need to kind of get a feel for what that refers to. Um, 
we'll consider several processes together to describe uh, the air conditioning system. Um, so we're going to put together a bunch of these processes and work our way around a cycle here a little bit. For example, uh, for summer air conditioning, basically the idea is we're going to we're going to supply low uh, temperature, low moisture air to the space to absorb the total heat gain. So the air will be dry enough that it will uh, control the humidity and it'll be cool enough that it'll control the uh, space temperature. Uh, warm moist air returns to the conditioning unit where it's mixed uh, with some uh, hot humid air from outside and then the mixed air uh, goes across the coil dehumidified and resupplied to the space. Uh, and we have defined uh, sensible heat factor thusly and I it says example 3.8, but I don't have example 3.8 scanned into the other file, so we're going to have to skip over that for now. We might go pick it up later. Um, so let's go, let's go ahead. So we need to define what we call a condition line. And uh, it typically will run between points one to two. Uh, and extension to the left, uh, will satisfy load requirements for a particular sensible heat factor at any point on the line. Just change the CFM uh, as you move on the line, you get closer, uh, the closer the two points. Yeah, the greater the CFM. Okay, so here, and I know that's not very clear. So let's take a look at this and I'll explain it to you. Okay, so two is my room condition. That's the condition that I want to maintain in my space. Well, this is the condition line. And the way I got this condition line is I ran the carrier program and I got the sensible load, the latent load and the total load, okay? And then I came up here and I calculated the sensible heat ratio or factor whatever you want to call it. And so that's just the sensible load divided by the total load. And so that's the number. So in this example, I'm saying it's 0.7. Okay. Then I come over to the protractor. And if you remember, let's go back to the protractor. The inside scale is sensible heat factor, the ratio. Make it bigger. There you go. So there's sensible heat divided by total heat. And so oh, I come over to this side and um, you see there's 0 0.6, there's 0 0.7, there's 0 0.8. So I, I draw me a little line from this 0 0.7 through the center up here on the top line. And I take that slope and that's the slope of my condition line. So that's where I get that slope from. And that comes from the simulation on the space. And hopefully I put the data in the computer right so that I get the right sensible load and right total load. And so then I draw a line with that slope down here and I can go all, I wanna, well, sometimes you, you wanna go all the way to the 100% relative humidity point. That point where that condition line, no, that's not true. I'm getting ahead of myself. Just strike that, but, but basically you can draw this line all the way down to the relative humidity. Now, okay, and so you put point, point one is defined by the point that you're actually gonna come off of your coil. And see that ha really has to do with what's the, what's the capability of the coil, you know? You, you probably can't put it all the way back here because that's almost a hundred, percent relative humidity and saturation and you your coil doesn't have the ability to get that close to saturation this point is typically are between 0 0.9 and 0 0.95 uh i'm sorry or 90 and 95 percent relative humidity see this line's 100 percent relative humidity and so you can't get all the way back there so and it depends on the ability of the coil and when you actually select a unit 
the manufacturers give you tables or they have selection software that knows the performance of their coils. <clears throat> so that allows you to select this uh, uh, supply air temperature into the space coming off of the coil at something that the unit can actually achieve. Okay, but so this line is called the condition line. Okay, so theoretically, air at any point on this line can satisfy this load that you have simulated because it has the right ability to dry the space and the right ability to sensibly cool the space based on the ratios that came out of your computer simulation. So it's kind of cool. So you simulate uh, in the HAP software, you get your sensible load, total load, you form that ratio, you come up here, you get that slope and whatever point you want to maintain in the space, this is degree C. So for us, it might be, it might be 72 and 50% relative humidity. You put a dot there and then you draw that slope all the way back over here. And then you come back and say, okay, you know, these units, uh, my unit can provide 56 degree air. Okay. At, 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 at this right, at this correct moisture level in, in the air. So you say, okay, I'm gonna select this at 56 Fahrenheit or 15 degrees C. And you come up and you put that dot. Okay, then these are the, these are the points that you're working with. And this is the flow rate, or this is the mass flow that you need defined by this dot in order to satisfy your total load in the space, both latent and sensible. So that's kind of the way this goes. It might be a little rambling, but um, I think that's. And as we go through a couple of uh, examples, it'll become clear to you. Okay, so let's move on to our first system. Okay, example 3-9. Okay, so this is pretty good. So you can look at it. And so this kind of simulates, hey, what actually happens uh, in the uh, design world, okay? So here's a space, we simulated it. This is the result from the HAP simulations from the carrier program. So the total load is 60,000 BTUs an hour and the sensible load is 42,000 BTUs an hour. So the sensible heat factor is what? 42 divided by 60. 42 divided by 60 is 0.7. Well, how convenient. <laughs> that's his favorite number, but that's fine. Okay, so in these problems, we assume that the space that we're, the temperature that we maintain, 78 and 65, is the return air temperature. Now, in the real world, if we were maintaining 78 and 65, by the time we got this back to the unit, and you know, he's got three here and four here. So we could put some duct heat gain and all that stuff. But this air in reality is gonna be warmer when it really gets back to the unit because it's traveling through unconditioned areas and it doesn't have perfect insulation and it's hot outside because we're air conditioning and all that sort of stuff. So, but you know, we do some simplifications in the, in the problem. Uh, we can have some exhaust air that leaves, depending on the problem. And in fact, say if we're bringing in outside air, we probably do have to dump some air over here so that we don't continually pressurize the space. Now, in reality, you might want to pressurize the space a little bit so that you had air leaking out through cracks and doors when they open instead of air leaking in. Uh, it's better to lose a little of your conditioned air than it is to bring in a chunk of outside air if you had negative pressure. So having positive pressure on the space is you know, typically a, a, a good thing. Uh, you could have a return air fan, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, we bring in, we bring back return air, we bring in outside air. So now we have a mixing problem right here. And then we get a mixed air condition at one, which goes across the coil. And he's showing a one prime. 
and because then it has to go through the fan, which puts a little bit of heat in it. So one prime uh, and two are not quite the same state. A lot of times it's left out of the simple problems, but in reality it's there. And then, so in this case, we're putting in two the supply air and three is the space condition, which is the return air. Okay. So let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, well, so let's look at the uh, psych chart here and then we'll go, we have an example problem where we actually work through those numbers. Okay, so three is the condition in the space. So if you're given a problem, you're, given, you're always given the condition you want to maintain in the space. So you got a dry bulb temperature and you got a uh, relative humidity, you got some other variable that lets you plot 0.3. So 0.3 is the condition in the space, which is this condition we're coming out with. Okay. Um, 0 0.0 is my outside air condition. So in this case, it's, uh, it's given at 90 and 55%. And we're also given the flow rate. Okay. But so I can put a dot here. Well, okay. So one thing I know that <clears throat> air from three, and we're going to say that three and four are the same. So air from three and zero mix to produce air at one. Oh, well, there's three and there's zero. So let me draw a straight line in between those two, right? And then when I do the mixing, when I do the calculations, I can determine where point one is. Okay. But point one is the mixed air condition. And then we go across the coil. Okay. Well, so one to two is what the coil does for me. Okay. My condition line, my space condition line that came from my loads runs between two and three. Okay, so I calculate, I, I took that 0.7 up here to the protractor and I got that slope and I came down here to three and I laid out this line with a slope of 0.7 and I just drew it down. And then I selected based on equipment capability, whatever I wanted it to be that's reasonable. I pick whatever this dry bulb temperature is and then I go up to my condition line and that defines point two. So two to three is the conditioning of the space. Okay. One to three is what the unit has to do <clears throat> to cool the mixed air down to this condition two, which is what I need to go into my space to satisfy my load. So uh, you might want to go back and listen to this a couple of times, but that's kind of what's going on here. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So let's go look at the uh, example problem here. Okay. So yeah, here's the same thing. Oh, and that, uh, it says 750 there, but when he works the problem, he actually uses 500. So that was a misprint. So on this copy, I've scratched that out. And uh, later copies of the book uh, corrected this, but Anyway, this is on a, a previous uh, edition where they had not caught that error yet, but it should just be 500 given to you. Okay, so let's read now the problem. We'll get through this one and this will probably be the end of class today. Um, okay, a given space is to be maintained at 78 degrees wet bulb or dry bulb, I'm sorry, and 65 wet bulb. So those are the two points that allow you to locate uh, this point three on the sock chart. So there you go, there's our sock chart. So we get that, we run the sock chart, put that dot, that's the start of it. Okay, total heat gain to the space has been determined to be 60,000 BTUs an hour from the computer simulations of which 42,000 BTUs an hour is sensible. 
uh, the outdoor air requirement of the occupants is 500 CFM. And where does that come from? That comes from ASHRAE 62, the ventilation code, which you hopefully know a little bit about now. The outdoor air has a temperature and relative humidity of 90 Fahrenheit and 55% respectively. Determine the quantity and state of the air supplied to the space and the required capacity of the heating and humidifying equipment. Okay. So first thing we're going to do when you get these loads is you want to calculate your sensible heat factor. And like we said, that's 0.7. Okay. So what you would do then in the order that you would do it in, you would come in from state three and you would draw this line at that slope of 0.7 and you can draw it as far as you want to. Okay, uh, so the state of the air entering the space lies on the line defined by the sensible heat factor on the site chart. Therefore, state three is located, we talked about that, and a line is drawn through that point. Um, and you're gonna draw it for cooling, you're gonna draw it to the, the left and for heating, you'll draw it to the right, um, parallel to a sensible heat factor 0.7 line on the protractor. Okay, state two may be any point on the line is determined by the operating characteristics of the equipment desired out to wear. So all that stuff come, come into play. Uh, these aspects of the problem develop later. For now, uh, assume the dry bulb temperature cannot be more than 20 degrees less. So that gives you an, a way to determine. So um, we're 78, subtract 20. We're gonna say that T2 is 58. So you got to have some way to select this T2. So just for the simple problem solution, he says, use 58. Okay, so you take 58, you go back up to the condition line and you put a dot and that's state two, okay? Uh, state two is determined, okay. So then the air quantity required can now be formed from an energy balance on the space, okay? So then, once you have on the side chart defined states two and three, you do an energy balance on the space. Okay, well, what's that look like? It's pretty simple. So we've got the mass flow rate uh, coming in at two times the enthalpy at two, plus we've got Q dot, which is the total load, which is uh, 60,000 BTUs an hour, and that has to equal uh, M dot A3 times I3. In this case, those two mass flow rates are the same, and that's usually the case for us because you know we're not pulling exhaust out yet, if there is any. Okay, so then we collapse down and we just call the mass flow rate M dot A2. And, um, we solve the equation for the, uh, well, I, 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 we, we <laughs> I'm sorry, we solve the equation for M dot uh, 2A. Okay, this is just taking a couple of steps to write the equation. This substitutes the, uh, we get M dot A3 equal to M dot A2, and then we factor, and then we solve for M dot, the mass flow rate uh, of air into the space. So that's the 60,000 divided by the enthalpy difference from this is the return of the, the air exiting the space. And this is the supply air at 58, which we just pull off of the site charts. So I'll say there's I2 and there's I3. So we just read them, plug them in. So your author's done that. And he says I3 is 30 and uh, I2 is 23 or 60,000 BTUs per hour total load, the difference. So we get uh, 80, 8,570 pounds mass dry air per hour. And you know they always want the, the volume flow. And so then this is just kind of the reverse. So you take the uh, pounds mass of dry air per hour times the specific volume. And that would be at this condition because that's the condition that we calculated it for. Uh, specific volumes, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.21, 13.
And this is uh, BTUs per hour. And so we got to divide by 60 to get hours to minutes. And so this gives us 1,890 cubic feet per minute of supply air. Okay, so now we got to look at the uh, unit itself. And so uh, we're, let's see. To, to, so, uh, so this is our mixing situation. Let's see, up here. So we're gonna say, I think that uh, the condition at three is the condition at four, but anyway, so, and then if you had a return fan, you'd put some heat in, but we're, we're not putting return fans in and all that stuff. So we've got four and zero we're mixing to produce one. And so what now we do our mixing. So M dot zero plus M dot four is equal to uh, M dot A one. And that's the same as M dot A two. If you look at the, at the flow, because whatever mass flow we have through here goes all the way through and we don't change the mass flow rate of dry air. So one, one prime and two, the mass flow is all the same. Okay. So uh, we had the uh, volume flow rate of outside air. And so we, we, we've got to convert that to a mass flow rate. So we have to get the specific volume of the outside air, which is hot and humid. So that turns out to be 14.23 uh, off of your site chart. Again, you should check this, make sure that you can pretty close to verify these numbers. You might not get exactly the same thing, but you should get something pretty close. Uh, and then, so this is 500 uh, cubic feet per minute times 60 is cubic feet per hour divided by specific volume. We get 2110 pounds mass dry air per hour, okay? And so um, M dot four is equal to the uh, M dot two minus M dot zero. And so this is the return air portion because this is the total end of the space. This is the mass flow rate of the ventilation air. So the difference has to be return air. So we got 2110 outside and 6460 coming in. So right here, we got 6460, we got 2110, and we get uh, what, 85, what is it, 70, whatever that number is. Yeah, 8570 is the total, okay? Uh, so then we do the mixing. And so on the psych chart, he's gonna do the uh, graphical technique. So you see that, um, you, you know the mass flow rates of outside air and we know the total mass flow. So the outside divided by total is about, uh, it says 0.246, about 0.25. And so then line segment um, 3.1 is 0.25 of 30. Okay, it doesn't look like quite, but so the three, they're, they're saying so three zero is the long one. You take 25% of it and you put a dot at one. Looks like you blew the point a little bit, but anyway, they draw the diagrams so that they're clear. So they're not always exactly the scale, but at any rate. So that's how you would define this point one from the mixing. Do, 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 do. Okay, so state one, he reads at uh, off of that point as 81 dry bulb and 68 wet bulb. A uh, line constructed from state one to state two on the chart then represents the process uh, in the conditioning equipment. So that's the cooling coil. So the cooling coil has to take us from one to two. Now notice the, co the cooling coil has more load than just the space because it has this hot outside air coming in. So the amount of energy the coil has to remove is more than is required to just condition the space, again, because of the outside air loading. So our coil load is larger. Okay, let's see. Okay, so then here is my uh, coil load. 
So it's the total mass flow rate at one or two, it's the same number, times the enthalpy difference one to two across the coil. And so he reads that as 32.4 minus 23, or 80,560 uh, BTUs per hour, or 6.7 tons. 60,000 BTUs, the space load is only five tons. So see, we're picking up 1.7 tons uh, of outside air, okay? Now, for the coil, we can also develop a sensible heat factor for the coil. And so you can, you can then, so that you can take the slope of this line, the coil line, and take it back to the protractor and draw it up here. And then you can read this number and that's a sensible heat factor for the coil. Kind of interesting, okay. Mm. Okay, so a sensible heat factor for the cooling unit or coil uh, is found to be 0.6 using the protractor. So if this 80,560 BTUs an hour is my total load, my sensible portion of it is 6 tenths, or 48, uh, 340, and my latent load is the rest, which is 32, uh, 220. So he says the sum of these two is known as the coral refrigeration load in contrast to the space condition load. So, you know, we got to keep that uh, in mind that the coil also sees the outside air load. The coil will also see fan load, okay? So the coil has to accommodate fan load, fan energy that gets put in, which is a little bit as well. So the, the, the problem we worked here is of course a simplification, but you know, it's approaching you know, an analysis that uh, mirrors what you would do on a real system. So it's pretty good. And then he starts talking about here, um, fans and uh, actual fan systems are required to move the air and some energy uh, may be gained from this. So if we go back to this guy, and then we go down to here, ah, now he's putting in, uh, the fan loads, and he's exaggerating them a little bit so that you can see them. So this is basically the same psych chart, and he's putting in some duct heat gain and stuff like that. So let's go look. So again, three is the space condition, and that's the return air right out of the space, and two is the supply air condition that we need. Okay, so the definition of two and three and zero and there's the same points. One is the mixed air that goes into the coil. That's gonna change a little bit. And the condition out of the coil is gonna change a little bit. So if we go back up to here, now let's look. So three to four, we're gonna pick up some sensible heat. That's gonna get warmed up a little bit because those ducts almost always run above the drop ceiling or above a hard ceiling. And it's not conditioned up there, so it's warmer than, uh, you know, in the space. And so what happens from three to four is sensible heat gain in the ductwork. And then four to four prime is fan heat going across a return fan, if you happen to have a return fan, okay? Now what's nice is that the HAP program We'll plot these points out for you and they'll put this stuff in for you. But, you know, if you're working a problem by hand, you got to put it in by yourself. And so then four prime is actually the condition that gets mixed with the outside air because we have duct heat gain and we have fan energy that gets put in. So instead of running from three to zero, now we're running from four prime to zero. So we do our mixing and we get point one. And now let's go back and we're coming out at one prime because we know that we're gonna go across a fan from one prime to two and that fan's gonna heat it up a little bit. So we gotta come out colder at one prime to then allow the fan to warm it up to the desired condition at two, okay? And so that's what we're doing here. So. 
now we've designed this. Um, if this is 58, now this might have to be 57 or 56, you know, depending on how many degrees of increase we expect across the fan. Usually it's not much. So that I, this is drawn, it's blown up a little bit. So you can, you know, see what's going on. But then, so we would come out at one prime. When we go across the supply fan, we pick up enough heat to move us sensibly because that's sensible heating. We're not doing any more moisture removal to uh, two. And then that's on the condition line. So that's what goes into the space to uh, satisfy the load. Okay, so that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So you've got your first psychometric homework you should be working on. And so that's due when we come back from break. And I hope everybody has a wonderful break and be safe. Uh, and then we'll finish up going through these cycles. We'll probably one more lecture, I guess, to finish this up. You'll have another homework assignment and then we'll have our test on psychometrics. So not the week we come back, but maybe the week after we'll see, maybe the Thursday or the week after break, if not the following Tuesday would be what I'd be thinking. So anyway, with that, I'll stop, uh, stop the recording and wish you guys a great rest of the day. And like I said, be safe at break and we will be back a week from uh, Tuesday. Take care.